Let us look at the following uh, Lagrange example um, where we're going to use what's called the Kuntucker method to solve it. Uh, we have um, an objective function here that we want to maximize. Uh, notice that it's nonlinear and we want to maximize it subject to not one but two constraints. Um, z is less than or equal to xy and x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to 3. Notice both both of these are also nonlinear um, constraints and of course because there's two of them uh, that's what's going to make us use the Kuntucker method where we do the following. We assume uh, that one of the constraints is uh, non-binding um, or if you will redundant and just uh, solve with the other one and then go back and check. So let's try this out. So step one, we're going to assume that uh, what we're gonna call constraint two here is non-binding. And basically what that means, we're going to ignore it. Um, so we're going to develop our Lagrange function as the following. Grab your objective function here and pop it into the Lagrange and then um, add in uh, lambda 1 for constraint. And then you can move um, the uh, like either to either side. So you can move the x, y with the z on the left hand side or vice versa. I'm just going to pop the x, y on the left hand side with the z. Um, so I'm going to pop in z minus x, y in my bracket here. Um, and I'm going to go and take all of my derivatives now according to my three original variables and my one dummy variable that I'm using, lambda 1. Okay, and again I'm going to assume that constraint number 2 is satisfied. Um, basically, so I'm not um, I'm not going to worry about that constraint, it's satisfied. I'm going to go solve and see what happens and check constraint 2 later. Okay, so let's go get all of our derivatives now. So minus 2x uh, minus lambda 1y is my first partial derivative with respect to x. Uh, and then z minus 2y minus lambda 1x is my next partial derivative with respect to y. And then y minus 2z plus lambda 1 for my next one. Finally, with respect to lambda 1, um, here is my partial derivative. Um, <clears throat> now, my favorite method after that is to go and isolate the lambda 1s in each of my expressions. Uh, you don't have to do it this way. I just find this always works. So I always go isolate lambda 1 and then set the expressions for lambda 1 equal to each other and see what comes out of it. Especially when you have lots of variables and um, especially if you have nonlinear um, constraints and um, equations here it can get quite messy. So if you kind of make yourself a plan of attack here it helps. So again I always just isolate lambda. So in this case lambda 1. Uh, and then in this next one, LZ, um, lambda 1 equals to 2Z minus Y. I'm just going to pop these two to the other side. Okay, so those are my three expressions for lambda 1. Now, of course, trying to decide what to set equal to what, um, I am going to grab... Um, let's see, I'm also actually going to do one thing first here because I still have all of my variables and all the equations and at a first glance there's nothing obvious that's going to kind of drop out of them. I'm going to use this constraint here next and um, I'm going to go and use the relationship that pops out of it that z equals to x, y and at least that will get rid of z in my above equations and just boil this down to two variables instead of three in them. So z equals to x, y. I'm going to go work with that and I'm also going to go and start working with uh, my expressions for lambda 1. Uh, I'm going to work with the, the last two here. Um, 
these guys uh, and set them equal to each other. And that gives me 2z minus y equals to z minus 2y over x. Okay, and now I'm going to go replace um, z with xy here and here. And let's see what I get. So 2 times xy minus y equals xy minus 2y over x. Uh, and then start cleaning this up a little bit. Okay, um, so then I get the following. Now that we've got this expression, you might notice, um, you might not, but uh, every single expression within this equation has a y in it. So we can actually go and cancel out all of the y's. Okay, uh, and if we cancel out all of the y's, we're left with the following. 2x minus 1 equals to x minus 2 over x. I'm going to times both sides by x to get rid of it on the right hand side and that leaves me with 2x minus 1 um, sorry uh, times by x gives x minus 2 so 2x squared minus x, uh, pop these two over, minus another x plus 2 equals 0, and 2 um, x squared minus 2x plus 2 is 0, uh, and that leaves us with the following solution for x, minus 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 2 squared minus 4 times 2 times 2 using the quadratic equation all divided by 2 times a which is also 2 um, and this will actually become um, an imaginary number when we try to solve for it uh, in the inside of the square root we're going to end up with the following uh, so positive 2 plus or minus the square root of 4 minus 16. So that gives us minus 12 inside of the square root. So x has no real number solutions. So unless you're looking for the solutions that contain imaginary numbers, we would stop here and we would say that there is no real number solution um, for this um, this scenario here. And this scenario is where we assumed that constraint 2 was non-binding and that constraint 1 was binding. Um, and again, so x won't have um, a real solution, z won't either because it's also um, associated with x. So we just say there is no solution. So what we do next, step number two, is to assume that constraint number one is non-binding. It's redundant. Um, it's satisfied. We don't need to worry about it. When we maximize, we don't hit that limit. We don't run over the, out of that constraint, whatever it is. Um, so we only work with constraint number two. So our Lagrange function becomes the following. Um, yz minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared plus lambda one, or sorry, lambda two, forgive me. So our second constraint times x squared minus y squared, or sorry, x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus three. I'm going to move the minus three to the left-hand side. Again, make sure to collect all of your values on one side of the equation to do this. Then go get your derivatives for this guy. Oops, sorry about that. And it is the following lx, ly, lz, l lambda 2 gives the following here. Minus 2x plus 2 lambda 2x equals 0. 
z minus 2y plus 2 lambda 2y equals 0. Um, y minus 2z plus 2 lambda 2z is 0. And x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 3 equals 0. This is a much nicer problem to solve. Um, there's a lot of symmetry going on between our x squareds here. Um, and our x squareds, y squareds, and z squareds, if you will. Um, and um, a lot of values end up cancelling out. Out of this first one, 2 lambda 2x equals to 2x um, is what I start getting here. My goal, again, I'm going to isolate lambda 2 in each of these equations. Now what's really nice here is that almost everything cancels out uh, and lambda 2 is just 1 out of that first expression. Out of the second one, if we know that it's 1, then I don't need to isolate lambda 2 anymore. I already have the value. So let's just write out this second expression here after plugging in lambda 2 equals to 1. Okay, and in this one, um, the two y's end up, end up cancelling out and I get a very simple calculation here for z. z just must be 0. Then in the next expression, I'm going to plug in z at 0. I know that already. I know that lambda 2 is 1. I'm going to plug that in. Another 0 here for z. So again, z is 0. We know that already. We know that lambda 2 is 1. Plug all of those in. And we just end up with y equal to 0. Because those are just both 0. So now we know that lambda 2 is 1, z is 0, y is 0. And then keeping going here, um, last expression, so we know z and y are 0. So in this last one we know that x squared plus 0 plus 0 minus 3 equals to 0. So x squared equals to 3. x equals to plus or minus the square root of 3. Okay, so we get two possible solutions. Assuming that we allow um, x to be both positive and negative, then our two possible solutions are the following. Um, positive root of 3, 0 and 0 for x, y, and z. Or again, if we allow a negative solution for x, if it's not a quantity or something like that, then a negative square root of 3, 0 and 0 are, uh, is another possible solution. And what we need to go do is we need to make sure that these solutions satisfy constraint number one because again, we assumed constraint number one was non-binding or is satisfied. Um, so again, constraint number one was the following. Okay, uh, it was that um, z was less than or equal to x times y. Okay, and so um, in this case let's double check that um, z, which is 0 in both cases, it's less than or equal to uh, root of 3 times 0 and is 0 for z less than or equal to uh, negative root of 3 times 0 and in both cases yes because it's just 0 less than or equal to 0 in both of those cases. So since constraint 1 is satisfied then we have our two possible solutions. At root of 3, 0, 0, and negative root of 3, 0, 0, with our lambda um, at 1. Um, and we would assume lambda 1 would be 0 as we're ignoring constraint number 1 in that f second um, step. Then basically we're inherently setting lambda 1 to 0. 
um, and lambda 2 to 1. Um, we don't always look at the values of lambda. They do tell us um, some important information as well. Um, if you do need them, again, lambda 1 would be 0 and lambda 2 would be 1. Um, that lambda 2 equaling to 1 was what we found previously.